just one more title to review from the 2015 summer collection of the Richard and Judy Book Club and what a great shelf of books they are. People email me sometimes and ask me what happened after the end of the book. Is everybody all right? And it's just very odd that it all has sort of a life of its own, completely outside of my own head. Once you've finished a book, it's not yours anymore. It's a reader's. Books make connections in all sorts of ways that you haven't anticipated. One of the things I love most is when people point stuff out to me that I didn't even realise myself when I was writing it. And when the characters become as real to them as they are to me, that's just a magical moment. The real life of a book is when there's two people that has read the book and are starting to talk about it to create friendship or they hate each other because they don't agree at all on the book. I really hope that people aren't too disappointed when they read a book and ask themselves, how could they pick this? This is just a fairly fat Swedish guy. He's a Scandinavian and no one dies. No one gets murdered. You have this idea in your head and it's just in your head and nobody else's. And then gradually you start to tell people, other people read the book and then when your book's published, you suddenly know that real people in the real world are, are reading it and talking about it, hopefully, and, and book clubs exacerbate that process so that suddenly you've got people sitting around in a group talking about something that just started as a tiny idea in your head. It's pretty interesting to think that people are out there talking about your book, you know, bringing their own issues to it, having their own take on it, because once you've written it, once it's out there, it's not really yours anymore. It's theirs to read and to look at, you know, to, to interpret. And people bring something to every book, to things that you can't imagine. A fantastic group of writers, I'm sure you'll agree. And Karis Bray is the final one we have to meet. With God, all things are possible. That's what it says on Mum's painting of a bird with its wings spread wide in flight on the kitchen wall. Miracles are like birds. They zip through the gap between heaven and earth on hollow boned wings. You can't catch them with traps or nets or special glue. You have to use words. Our next book on our list is A Song for Issy Bradley and it's written by Karis Bray. And Karis is here with us now. Hello, Karis. Hello. Um, beautiful book. I mean, absolutely stunningly written, elegiac, heartbreaking in many ways, but also in some ways also very funny, very amusing. Um, and the central story, it, it's basically, this sounds boring, but it's not. It, this, it's about faith and it's about religion in many, many ways. Because Claire, who is the sort of, if you like, the heroine of the book, she's the mother, she has four children, is a practicing Mormon uh, living in Southport with her husband, Ian, who is um, uh, very high up in the sort of uh, religious structure. He's a bishop. Now, most of us know next to nothing about Mormonism mm -hmm. um, and um, it's, uh, it's a really, really interesting, eye-opening book to read. Just to preface this, you yourself were, not now, but you were yourself born into a devout Mormon family, was, weren't you? Yeah. yeah. Was. And was that in Southport too? I was born in Southport but we moved, my dad got a job in Devon um, when I was 10. Hmm. Um, so I sort a of... A job within the church? No, no. he was, he was um, a deputy head of a uh, school for the deaf in right. Devon, right. Um, so we moved down to Devon. So I sort of it felt like I'd grown up really in Devon, but yeah. but then I moved um, back to Southport as an adult. Yeah. So and how many of you were in the family when, when you moved down? Um, there were five of us, five children, and my parents. And would you describe yourself as a devout family? Yeah, definitely. And you, and you as well. Yes, very much so. So what yeah. happened? When did you when did you break out? Um, I think it was when I had my own children actually, and I. I realised that there was, they weren't going to absorb this by some sort of magical osmosis. <laughs> I was going to have to enforce it. And I found that I actually just, I, I didn't, well, I couldn't do it and I didn't want to do it. Um, and what yeah. about your husband? Did you marry a fellow Mormon? Yeah, I yeah. did. So, so fortunately, it was a sort of, um, it was a choice we made together. And yeah. otherwise, I think it, it might have been quite difficult. And what about your the wider family? What about parents and that? I mean, so my are you estranged or, or do no, they accept no. it? No, they, they accept it. My husband's family are all still Mormons. Mm -hmm. um, my siblings aren't, but my parents are. Um, and it's it's been fine. I sort of think about it as, you know, the, the Mormon church and I have had um, an amicable divorce <laughs> and, and we share custody of my parents. 
<laughs> well, just before we get fine. back to the book, just, just before we get back to the book, I just want to just for the for people listening, could you just encapsulate just in a couple of sentences the essence of Mormonism, the faith, and what makes it different? Oh gosh, um, Mormons believe that that um, that this life is is a test, basically. So they believe in a pre-existence in which everybody who chose to come to the earth, um, chose to come here, and that they wanted to do really well in this test, and the test involves um, finding the true church, which is the mm. Mormon church, and then um, going to the Mormon temple, getting married, having a family, and then after you die, um, living with that family for eternity. In the afterlife. Yeah. And that, that, of course, brings us straight back to the book, A Song for Issy Bradley, and that sort of is at the essence, really, of, uh, of, of the story, the plot, and also of Claire, the mother of Issy, the mother of four children, um, her grief when her daughter Issy, aged four, becomes very, very ill, and I'm not giving anything away because it happens very close to the beginning of the book, actually does die. Um, and really, then, we come to Claire's struggle to accept this within the Mormon faith, which you've, you've mm. just said very eloquently, believes that death is really, it's not that death is nothing at all, it's not that open, but that, that you will meet that person further yeah. on. Um, and you will, yeah. you will carry on and therefore she is grief stricken, as she would be, the mother. Her husband, Ian, who is, um, I mean, she's a sort of recruit Mormon, isn't she? She wasn't yes, always a Mormon. He, right. was, he is a devout Mormon. He actually tries very hard to grieve within the Mormon faith. She isn't, for example, allowed when it comes to the funeral. She isn't actually allowed to have, which she wants to have, a slideshow mm -hmm. showing Issy as a baby and, and as she grew up through toddler, because that's not Mormon. Um, is, is that right? It's, well, it, there are rules about what can happen in the actual chapel bit of the building, and so they don't, they wouldn't show um, a slideshow. I mean, you could do it afterwards in a different part, perhaps. I see. But yeah, the, the, sometimes there's not very much flexibility. Mm. Um, you might you might find a Mormon bishop who actually turned a blind eye and said, no, that's fine, we'll just do it anyway. But Ian Bradley's not that kind of person. <laughs> no, no. What's interesting is that very, very often when a couple lose a child, um, it can break them up because the father grieves in a very different way mm. sometimes from, from the mother. There's a male way of dealing with it and a female way. And I think really what's really clever about the book is that that's exacerbated by the faith, isn't it? Rather I than bringing so, them together, yeah. um, it pushes them way further apart. I think it, it does. And I just, I've always been interested in the way grief affects different people in very, very different ways mm. and the way that you know, religion can be profoundly comforting for some people and maybe other people don't want don't want to be comforted in that way, they need something different. Yeah, and I mean, I, I, I love the fact also that um, Ian's parents uh, are on a Mormon mission mm -hmm. somewhere, and that actually it's seen as more important that they, even though their granddaughter, their little granddaughter's just died, it seemed more important that they stay with the mission than, than actually Being attend the funeral. It sounds a very hard religion, but actually it's not. You don't, uh, you don't, I mean, you, the, the way you portray it, it's actually f full of love, isn't it? Full of love and yeah. practical. I think uh, there are some absolutely lovely things about what, being a Mormon. When we moved to Southport, I was um, three. I was pregnant with our third child. I was about seven months pregnant, and um, we just called ahead a um, few weeks to say, you know, we're coming to live in Southport. We called the Mormon bishop there. And um, on the day that my husband arrived, because he drove the van himself up from Bournemouth where we'd been living, um, all of the men were there before work, seven o'clock in the morning. They'd all got up early. They unloaded the van, oh. put all the furniture away, and then off they all went to work. Yeah. And that's what it's like. Yeah. And you know, so there are some lovely, lovely things, and the people are lovely. Yeah. Um, but but also, know. I mean, Ian's responsibilities as a bishop are so intense that they mm. actually come before his family. So that yeah. if somebody rings him up and says, you've got to come because something, you know, even if it's actually something quite something trivial, silly. as it turns yeah. out, um, it means he misses his son's birthday party. Um, yeah. Even though he's promised Claire he will be there to help her and all those things. So the actual impact, I suppose it's probably the same for a lot of religions, actually, the actual impact on the, the, the family that is at the centre of the faith, they have to 
to sacrifice a lot. They do. And I, I had a really interesting email from somebody who'd grown up in it and her dad was the Church of England vicar. And she said, oh, I know it's a completely different religion, but it just reminded me of my family growing up. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, 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 I think that's well, the right. You, are, you say, are very funny. Sorry, just, sorry, just on, on. You are very funny about certain members of, of the yes. church and the kind of the, mm -hmm. the way they talk. Everybody's kind of sister and brother and all mm -hmm. the rest of it. And, you're, but, and does, did anybody that you know, did your parents, for example, have you, they read the book? Were they happy? They have. With it. Um, they don't, they're not, it's not their favourite book in the world, <laughs> it would be fair to say. Um, um, but I think, I think they were worried. I think they were worried people would read it and say, those weird Mormons are terrible, or awful people. And actually, most people have read it and said, oh, you know, it's not for me, but there are some really nice things Absolutely in there. Absolutely right, so I agree. Yes, no, you've I, done that very well. I think that's been okay. And I have to say, it's, this, I cannot stress to anyone listening to this how beautifully written uh, this book is about, about faith, about grief, about uh, motherhood. I mean, it is well, really Well, I was going to say, tremendous. just to send, you are a born writer, you really are. Oh, thank um, you. And did you always know that deep, deep within, that you had it within you to... It's what I did want to do, yeah. But I, you know, you... The idea is, is that you get married and have children and that's your primary responsibility yeah. and, and I did just sort of, it was easy, I, I could have done both, you know, and it was my decision, nobody from the Mormon church said, Karis, you mustn't, but no. for me it was easier to just put it all to one side and not think about it than it was to try and juggle yes. both, you know. Um, and when my children went to school, I thought, no, that's it. I'm going to I'm gonna do <laughs> well, now, this now. Well, well, now you've started. You've written, as Judy says, a wonderful novel. Um, it's uh, absolutely uh, straight in with a bullet to our book club list. You know, there's no question that it was going to make the list. What now? I'm just I'm working on a second novel. Totally different? Totally different. Nothing no, to do with the faith? No Mormons. I, prom <laughs> I promised Mormons. my dad. You've got the Mormons out of your system <laughs> I have, now. yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, but it, it's set in, in the same northwest seaside yeah. town but okay. a very different family. Well I, I, we understand why your parents wouldn't think it was the, their favourite book in the world but they should I hope they are very proud of yeah, you because you're very gifted. It's a, it's, it's a deeply moving book and also as I say at times very funny it's lovely. Thank, Thank you. you very much. And you. if you buy the book uh, from WH Smith which is of course where we hold our book club as it were up and down the high streets all over the country uh, you'll, you'll find it easily it's on its own stand it's got its own stickers and if you buy it from WH Smith then you have exclusive extra content in the back of the book there's a Q&A that Judy and I do with the writers they talk about their inspirations uh, and you only get that if you get it from WH Smith so uh, I'd go there if I were you. <laughs> have a good summer. Put simply, this is the Richard and Judy Book Club Podcast. I write while my children are at school and college. Um, mostly I write in the lounge. I've got a treadmill desk, um, which my husband <laughs> decided would be a really good idea because I was sitting down all day and, um, and I suppose he just didn't want me to have a heart attack. <laughs> so I walk uh, while I write. It goes really, really slowly. So you can, like, its sort of starting speed is 0.5 miles per hour, which really is just like standing on the spot and occasionally lifting your feet. So, you know, it's, it's very easy. I am quite disciplined at times. So at the moment, I have like a daily word count and I have to reach that before midnight. And so sometimes at, you know, quarter to midnight, I'm there typing as fast as I can. Um, other times I spend time reading or thinking, um, but it's, it's time to write again at the moment, so I am trying to be quite disciplined. People email me sometimes and ask me what happened after the end of the book. Um, uh, is everybody all right? What happened to this particular character? And it's just very odd that it all has sort of a life of its own, completely outside of my own head and my own experience. But that, it's quite lovely as well, I think. People have actually argued, and I, I haven't had to say anything. There's just like various people arguing about, you know, which characters they like or who's the baddie. And, and you just sit there and listen to people having an argument about something that you just made up. And it's really, really strange. So, like, my number one uh, piece of advice, I think, is to read and to read lots um, and to find out what, what it is that you really love and then write the book that you can't find. I like reading Carol Shields, um, I really love Ali Smith, and um, I love Helen Simpson's short stories, Margaret Atwood, uh, Rachel Cusk, 
I was at a reading recently and somebody said to me, oh, if you love Carol Shields, you should read Anne Tyler. And that's what I'm doing at the moment. I, th I think I'm on my fifth Anne Tyler book this year. And I, just, I think they're wonderful. Now, this is an extraordinary book. Um, I don't think I've read a book like it before. Um, basically, it's about a woman who has married into a Mormon family. Uh, and actually, we're not talking about Utah here, Salt Lake City, mm -hmm. none of that. We're talking about Southport. Now, when I first started reading uh, this book, I had, I suppose, if I'd thought twice about it, I would have assumed that, yes, of course, there must be Mormons in Southport, <laughs> Lancashire. But, you know, it had never occurred to me before. So my interest was immediately stimulated. And I'm so glad it was because it's a beautiful book. It's very elegiac. Yes, it's about faith. Yes, it's about grief, but it's completely and utterly beautifully written. Um, just to give you an idea, a quick idea of the story, Claire is a mother who has married uh, into a Mormon family. Uh, she has four children. Uh, they live in Southport. Her husband, Ian, is high up in the Mormon faith. He's a bishop. Uh, that means they have virtually no money. I mean, she, sp she spends all her time shopping at Primark and Asta. Uh, they live on chicken nuggets, but she makes the best of it, and she's really and she's very happy with her four children. And then, once something happens to the youngest, her four-year-old daughter dies of meningitis quite suddenly and quite quickly, and her whole life is turned upside down. And the essence of the book is: is the way that the Mormon faith treats death? Can she cope with it? Because it's a very strange way of dealing with death. Well, yes, they see, as the author herself described to us when we interviewed her, they Mormons see life as one enormous test. And if you pass the test that you're set, then you will go on to meet your beloveds in the afterlife, your That's children, right. your parents, all of those who've gone before. And your whole life is built towards Absolutely. eternity. So, for example, when this poor child dies, this four-year-old girl dies, the husband, who is, as you say, very high up in the Mormon church, sees it as a test and doesn't really mourn. Um, of course, at an elemental level, he does. He tries, level, he, does. Not to. He, tries he tries not to. He tries not to. He tries to put on this, this carapace of, of dealing with it because it's God's will and all of that. And, and the mother can't, can't be doing with that. It's, uh, it, it, it's agonizing. And then there are some tragic moments. For example, she wants to have a little sort of photo display of her, her daughter's life at the memorial service, at the funeral service in the Mormon church. And that's against the rules and it's not allowed. And it seems so hard hearted. So it's a very interesting book about not just about life and death and parenthood and marriage, it's really about faith. And what I found interesting was, and of course the writer is an ex-Mormon herself, was brought up as a Mormon, what's interesting is it shows how faith can be perfect for some people and torture for others. Mm. The same faith, the same families, and they can have very different experiences of But I don't want to make it sound too hard and too hard. Oh, it's very it funny in part. It's very, very, she's very funny about the Mormon way of life. She's very funny about a lot of the characters in the church, and she's very loving about her children. And it's a lovely book. Mm. It's, it's beautifully written. Uh, it will have you in tears, but it's also fantastically interesting and, and, and amusing. Now, we've been running this book club for many years now, and still we get something a little bit different each time we open a book and meet a new author. We get double the pleasure not only discovering the books we want to share with you, but also the chance to meet clever, talented and entertaining writers. And hopefully we've been able to share our enjoyment with you, and maybe inspiring you to try a brand new read. If you've only just found the podcast, you can go back through the internet shelves and listen to our older episodes reviewing books that are definitely still worth a read. Anyway, bye-bye. I hope you've had a lovely summer. Hope you enjoy the books and we'll be talking again soon. Mm -hmm.